I'd like to introduce Anna Silva. She's from the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research. Welcome, Anna. Hi, thank you, Katie. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start my presentation by thanking the organization for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm very honored to be here and to have this opportunity to share my work uh, with you guys. So I have to admit that uh, I'm <laughs> a little bit scared because uh, the organization asked us like, okay, could you please talk about uh, fish motion? And I was like, perfect, yeah, I know a little bit about this. I, I can come here and talk. And all of a sudden, I got the program with all the titles of the presentations, and I'm like, oh, okay, this sounds a little bit different from what I do. So, yeah. But uh, so I was sitting and listening to all of these nice thoughts, and I was thinking, like, oh, how should I integrate my talk on here? And the thing is, um, this morning, you, uh, we heard, like, really amazing talks, and they were all about, like, how fish move from one side of the world to another side of the world, and how fish have been changing all over the years. And, uh, you know, like even in the afternoon now, we, we also listen about this um, amazing phenomenon of like migration of eels, that they can move like up to 5,000 kilometers to go to the Sargasso Sea. We also heard about how like the climate change can impact like fish movement. But it's true, it's just like us, like, for us to run a marathon, we have to learn how to walk first. And that's the part that I'm talking here today. It's like, how do fish move from place A to place B? So I'm not going to talk about big migrations or big movements, but small, tiny movements that are very important for fish, because if instead of going to left, they go to right, they may end up in the wrong place and die. So that's also very important for fish. So let's go through a little bit of this <laughs> phenomenon. And uh, my presentation is divided in two parts. The first one is a little bit of theoretical part. And the second one, I'll try to explain how can we apply all the knowledge that we have in terms of theory and how fish move and everything in a conservation um, aspect. How can we put that in a practical way? What can we do to help them? So I start my presentation by challenging you a little bit and try to ask you, like, so what do these animals have in common? What does a cow have in common with a bumblebee or an elephant or even with us? Any thoughts? <laughs> it's a little bit tricky, yeah? They travel, they travel. That's, that's correct. Anything else? They move up and down, that's <laughs> But they're all correct answers, but uh, what they also have in common is the fact that they all move in fluids. And the fluids by being wind or water. Usually we think about fluids as water, but don't forget that wind is also uh, a fluid. So yeah, and that they not only move, but only by existing, they're already interacting with the fluids. And what I want to do here today is like I'm going to talk about fish and how do they interact with the fluid motion to what we call hydrodynamics. And it's like this interaction that allow fish to know where to go or help fish to guide them to go left, right, up and down, like we're talking as well, and to travel like small travels, big travels, etc. So I want you to imagine the two fish. So try to feel like a fish and try to think like a fish. So like if you are in a swimming pool and if you try to sit and go down in a swimming pool, what do you feel? It's, I've tried that a couple of times and I didn't succeed very well. It was a little bit difficult, you know. I had like go left, right, you know, I, you know, I tried to think and it didn't really work out. And uh, it's the same like, I don't know, any of you here dived before? Yeah, okay, so you experience that you put weights and weights and sometimes it doesn't work very well, but you're still putting, eventually you can dive, right? And so why does that happen? And, and that's exactly what a fish feels when it's inside water. That's because of all these forces that the fish is experiencing. So it's, it's, it's the experience forces that make him to go up, and then we have gravity to pull him down, 
And then we have these uh, forces that are like against the fish, that kind of so called the, trust, the drag forces, and then fish trying to go move forward, and then we have all these trust forces as well. So it's a combination of forces acting on a fish. So when he stands still in the water, he can feel all of these uh, forces acting, and he's trying to get balance and stability. But when he moves, it happens the same that happens when we're trying to swim. And this here is like a, an image of um, a swimmer, and it's like her last 40 meter nets before she got her golden medal in the Olympic Games in 2012 in London. And if you look. She's using her arms, using her feet, using her legs, just like we do when we're swimming. And that's exactly what the fish do. Like here we have an image of a manta ray, and you can see that's almost like the same movement with the spectral fins of the, um, sorry, with the appendix of the, the manta. So it's, it's almost like the same. So fish use these appendices, use their spectral fins, they use their tail, and they use all of this to try to get to this uh, synergy between the motion of the water and their own motion. So next, I'm going to show a small video. And I would like you to take attention to the different species of fish that will appear there. How do they use their appendix, like when they're like standing? Basically, they move. They can move like their practical fins like this, or standing like down or also their tails. Also, how do they move in schools? There's also an image that you'll see like moving in schools, and how do they interact? Also, like the different velocities, and how do they position themselves to achieve these different velocities? So let's try to see if this works. <laughs> Right. So maybe some of you already knew this movie. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Find Nemo. Okay, good. <laughs> but for those who haven't uh, seen it, it's a great movie. I truly recommend to watch it. And uh, one of the peculiarities of this movie is not it's not only just funny and very interesting, but also the fact that behind the scenes uh, we had uh, Dr. Adam from the University of Washington and he's an expert in uh, biomechanics. Um, and he was advising the people that were producing the movie about how fish move their appendix and how the different species move and how do they position themselves when they do this like bird speeding that's like the very fast speeding and etc. So there's a little bit more behind. So next time that you watch a movie, or for those that have never watched a movie, please, just take this into, retain this in your mind and just try to figure out what they're doing because it does really work, it's really, really fun. So basically fish, they use their different appendages to um, interact with, uh, with water. And by doing that, they also create like these different recirculation areas and etc. And this is like, uh, like you can see here on the, on the right side, so this is our different planes, like on horizontal and transversal and longitudinal, of what happens when the fish swim. So this is like taken, these results are, are taken by experiments that you can run with fish in a laboratory, and then you can, at the same time, you can see the water with some particles and uh, measure all the velocities and all the hydraulics uh, uh, around the fish and if in the interaction between the fish and the water. But fish also use their entire body to sustain themselves and also to position themselves. So they not only have to move back and forward, but they also have to position uh, and stabilize when they are inside water. And um, so some of the fish, uh, like this morning we heard like talking about evolution of the fish, 
And this is a sturgeon, it's a, a primitive uh, fish, so not so much uh, fluted, but maybe <laughs> you can <laughs> talk a little bit more about that. Here. So what happens here is like one of the things like the sturgeon does to stabilize is like it tilts its body. It's, it changes uh, what we call the um, body angle of attack. So the way that he positions himself, this to, to balance his forces with the forces of the water. So what happens is like when we have um, an increase of velocity, uh, as you can see in that graph on the left side, let's see if this works. Okay, perfect. So you have like the angle here, the position of the, of the fish, the body of the fish, and here you have the flow speed, meaning the velocity of the water. So if the velocity increases, then the angle decreases, meaning that it goes from this position to this position. And as you can see here, then there's a higher balance in terms of forces that makes that the fish will not move like this. So meaning, like the fish is trying to create this combination with the f uh, uh, water motion and its motion at the same time that it's trying to reduce its energetic expenditure, either to move or also to uh, stabilize in the water. So, fish can use uh, the body and the different appendages, and depending on how they use it, and in terms of extension of the body that they use and etc. to swim, they can be classified in the different types. They can be classified as anguliforms, uh, like the eels, and the eels they use the entire body to navigate, and they have this. Um, anguliform way of swimming, like all these, they curve all the body. On, for instance, like uh, the tuna, it mainly uses its tail to create all these forces that allow him to, to propel. So, fish have like different ways of, of using, and all of this is related uh, once again, and this is what I would like to emphasize, is related to decrease the energy that's associated to the locomotion, to their swimming. So, until now I've been talking about how do fish uh, connect with the water and uh, how do they position themselves in water, but what happens, like, they have to understand about all these variations and fluctuations in water, and so how, how, how do they do that? So it's like us, they have the central system that uh, is composed by the inner ear and also for the lateral line. Maybe most of you have heard about it. And in the lateral line, you have these uh, superficial and canal neuromas that are structures that allow fish to feel these different uh, variations of, of water and these different fluctuations. So, for instance, here, you can see that the fish, like, imagine that this is the, like, the center of the sign that the fish is feeling, and then you can see that it can feel through the, the front, and then all along its body, and etc. And this is like how fish can detect the different cues and the different vibrations and different fluctuations in terms of hydrodynamics. And fish feel it, it's not a point, so fish can feel it through all the entire body. And it's like the way that they feel that then make them to react differently, um, like uh, if they go to left, right, up, down, and to move in the very different angles. And again, uh, for the fish, moving like in this way, like rolling, is completely different than like moving like in a pinching way. Like, as you can imagine, moving this way, it's much more energetic, uh, costly, than moving like this. So it's also a challenge for them. So they try, they avoid this type of positioning, and that's what Sturgeon was doing as well. So there's like all these mechanisms that fish try to put it together and, and respond to, to these variations of, of flow so they can continue to move. And you know, it's, it's like us, like if we're going to a swimming pool and if we swim for many hours, after a while, we were exhausted. So fish, they have to find this balance about like their body and uh, the motion of the water. 
So here is an example that I was talking about. So these uh, structures, there are some airy cells, they exist all over the, the body of the fish, the superficial neuromast, while the canal neuromast mainly exists during the lateral line and also in the head. So for those that don't know what the lateral line is, this line here. So the difference between the superficial neuromast and the canal neuromast is that the fact that the superficial neuromast, they um, help fish to percept in terms of variations of velocity, while the canal neuromast can go and help fish to percept the variations in terms of accelerations, for instance. So they have different functions. Um, so this is uh, an example of the lateral line in a golden fish. And here you can see the canal neuromass in the, these openings. So the lateral line is one of the sensory um, systems of the, of the fish. And it's very important uh, in the role of schooling and behavior and the orientation of the fish and also in predation. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about uh, how fish interact with fluid dynamics in, in nature. So here I have a two pictures of the rivers. And when we first look there, we think that, okay, wow, that's pretty like an uh, agitated uh, river. It's very dynamic. And for those who like more adventure and adrenaline, it would be a nice river to go kayaking or etc. But um, fish can feel that as well. But sometimes we look to the river and it seems that it's very calm. But for fish, no. It's because they can feel all these different and very little fluctuations that we cannot even experience. So what happens then when fish are swimming? So they encounter like different obstacles like rocks, um, wooden logs, um, uh, fluctuations in the surface because of wind, etc. And this is what like we call, say that fish, they experience turbulence. So what is turbulence? Turbulence is something that most of you have experienced, I'm sure. I'm sure that most of you have traveled like in a plane or flight. And uh, sometimes the captain says, okay, you know, like just uh, fast your belts because we're going to pass through a turbulent area. And most of us, we don't like that turbulent area because it's pretty agitated. And in fact, for curiosity, when we feel a little bit of turbulence, it means that the plane drops around one to three meters of height. And that's because of variations of pressures between the different layers. So it's the same in water. And that's what the fish experience. So turbulence appears because of the interaction of the flow and different structures from the bottom of topography, banks, and structures like rocks. And there are some relevant parameters of turbulence that help to quantify turbulence that are also very important for fish. One of them is uh, turbulence intensity, and basically represents the intensity of the velocity fluctuations, so how fast velocity uh, change. The other one is turbulence kinetic energy. Uh, like the name says, it's like the energy associated to those fluctuations. Then we have renal shear stress. That is basically the Im imagine like that you have two different layers, one moving towards this direction, the other one moving that direction. So it's basically like the force like between these two layers. And the fish also can feel that. And then we have the eddy size and vorticity. That is easier for us to understand because we can see the eddies in, in rivers. So when I talk about turbulence, I think about Leonardo da Vinci. And you ask me, like, why Leonardo da Vinci, why not someone else? <laughs> well, Leonardo da Vinci was a great painter, as most of us know. But he was also an inventor, and he had many different um, interests. And one of them was hydrodynamics. And in fact, he was the first person that described a phenomenon that exists in, in rivers and that was later described in relation to fish movement. 
and they end up being the cover of uh, science. In 2007, uh, Liao tried to combine this phenomenon with fish and how fish move. But so what was that phenomenon? That phenomenon was the separation of fluid when encountered an object. And that's what's called the Carmen uh, vertex street. And this is the same that we have like in a rock. So basically you have the separation of the, the fluid because of an obstacle, and then you have recirculation layers that they move parallel one to another one and they interact. And Liao found that fish, they use the energy associated to those recirculation areas to move forward. So they position themselves and they position their body and their muscle and they can just use that energy to move forward. So this is uh, a figure of the, the paper from Liao where it shows how fish position themselves relatively to the eddy and how they can use that energy and propel and move forward and reduce the energy that they had to spend to move if they was not use that uh, that process. So, very smart. <laughs> but this process not only happen when you have a rock or an obstacle, but also fish when they are swimming in school, and like you saw it in a movie, you have the fish swimming in schools and they're all swimming more or less at the same distance, either in their horizontal plan or also in the vertical plan. And that has a uh, Specification. Why does that happen? And that happens because the fish themselves, they also create these recirculation areas, almost like a rock. And again, they use that energy. And this uh, phenomenon is the same that we see in birds. I'm sure all of you have seen like birds flying and migrating in a V shape. And it's the same process. So you have, for instance, like here, so you have the image of a geese, and usually geese, they fly in a V-shape. And the one on the top is the leader, and the leader is usually the stronger um, bird. The second one here is the second leader. It's like, the, not the strongest, but the second strong. And then if you see, they also create this circulation areas, we have some vorticity and some energy associated, and they can use this to keep moving. If they end up in this area, they just go back. So uh, I think it's very interesting that both fish and, and birds, they use the, the same system. In fact, like for instance with birds, they can decrease up to 20% of their energy to fly just by using these recirculation areas. So again, I think this is a good example that fluid is not only water, but it's also uh, air. So depending of their size, the eddies can or cannot help fish swimming. Until now, I was showing that they always help fish uh, swimming and they can use that energy and propel. But that depends of the relation of the eddy size and the relation of the total length of the fish. So for eddy size that are smaller than fish, up to two thirds of the total length of the fish, they can help fish swimming. But if they're too big, then they can make fish to lose stability or posture or lose like control and what happens is like they decrease swimming performance of fish. All the suddenly fish start moving in all directions, they get very lost, and then they don't know what to do, and they start to trying to move forward and put more energy, more energy, and they end up being very tired. And what is the problem of this happening? The problem is like, for instance, like this talk this morning, like one of the main factors um, that also impact fish and fish population is like human and uh, human uh, disturbance. And one of the main problems here is like hydropower. Hydropower tunnels, tunnels, turbines. Turbines fish, they end up in turbines. Why? 
because in front of intakes, usually we have these huge recirculation areas. And this is what happened. So they lose stability, they keep fighting, they keep fighting, and then they end up being dragged to, to the tunnels or to turbines, etc. So just a small movement may end up in their death. Another aspect that is very important is that shear stress that I talked before. So in one of my research, I study like um, barbels, like small barbels and big barbels, and uh, in a fishway. So fishway, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but the fishway is like a structure that helps fish going from downstream to upstream when they have like a, a barrier. And um, so basically what I found out is that the small fish, they do struggle more in the presence of very high levels of shears when those forces are very high. What that makes sense because like bigger fish are like more robust and they can pass that. So turbulence is very important to define fish movement in a small scale or in a fine scale. And as a summary, we can say that fish tend to avoid high levels of turbulence and that Turbulence can challenge control and body posture, as I showed before. Uh, fish swimming performance reduces by high turbulence intensity, meaning if those fluctuations of velocity are very high, then swimming performance decreases. It's like fish cannot swim so well, they cannot move so well. Uh, so more turbulent flows increase oxygen consumption. That's also another aspect. And uh, we have the eddy size that, depending on the size, uh, will have a higher or lower effect on uh, fish swimming. Uh, and that fish can use the energy associated to the eddies, and also that fish avoid these areas of high renal shear stress. But it's not only turbulence that affects fish, but also water velocity. And again, this is all a matter of energy. It's all a matter of how fish can keep their energy. Because if they spend too much energy, for instance, during their migrations, imagine like in the talk, the previous talk, we're talking about eels and migration of eels. So if they spend all their energy like trying to reach the Sargasso Sea, once that they reach the Sargasso Sea, they don't have the strength to spawn anymore. So fish have to play smart, and they have to try to orientate themselves in a way that they don't use all their energy. So it's the same with water velocity. So when the water velocity increases, the oxygen consumption of fish also increases, and that means that then fish like, end up getting more tired. So there's an increase in terms of uh, energy. And what fish do, it's like they try to position themselves to avoid big variations of uh, velocity. It's what they call the gradient direction uh, strategy. So when they feel that the velocity is going like stronger, then they try to change their positioning, and then they try to avoid these big variations, and they keep trying to go with the, f with the flow more or less. They don't go with the flow, but they go towards that direction. And the same happens for acceleration. Acceleration meaning like the big fluctuation in terms of velocity. So usually fish tend to avoid acceleration. And this is like what uh, Eva Anders, uh, she show in her research, uh, where each hero represents a salmon smolt, and the tip of the hero represents the head of the smolt. And uh, what you saw, it's like in areas of uh, high acceleration that are in red, then the fish, they change their real taxi position. That means they change their orientation. So instead of going like tail first, they move to head first and vice versa. So, but acceleration can also attract fish. So it's a little bit complex uh, because what I've been talking about here is like generally what happens to most of fish, but some species, they react differently. So when we think about uh, fish, swimming, hydrodynamics, fluid motion, 
we have to think that uh, the effects of hydraulics on fluid motion uh, on fish swimming behavior, it changed according to the magnitude and direction of the hydraulic components and very much depends on the fish species, life stage and the physiological condition of the fish as well. For instance, a species that's under stress will respond differently to the same magnitudes or the same orientation of an hydraulic variable if it was okay. It's the same thing happens to us if we have a flu or if we are healthy, right? It's the same, same thing. So, till now I've been talking pretty much about the theoretical perspective of what we call a little bit of uh, biomechanics and hydrodynamics. But uh, how can we use all of this knowledge and uh, put it in practice? How, how can we use this uh, to help fish conservation and um, to help uh, managers to understand how can improve things? Uh, so now I'm going to present a little bit of uh, studies that I've been working on. And um, before that, I would like to say that these studies are only possible because nowadays we have tools that allow us to make this combination between hydraulics and fish and biology and etc. So this is like a multidisciplinary approach. It involves many people, many different backgrounds, and it's, it's, it's very nice, I really like that. <laughs> so we have, for instance, tools in hydraulic, in the engineering world, tools that allow us to characterize velocities and map what's going on and all the hydrodynamics in a river, sometimes also in parts of the ocean, uh, etc. And we, can, we have very peculiar tools and instruments that allow us to have very accurate and very detailed information about that and that we can use them, for instance, in lab, in laboratory scale. So we can go from small scale or laboratory scale to river and the full scale, which, which is beautiful, I think. Then we also have uh, very interesting tools, like Hawken also presented with for the eels, that we have like all these different tags systems that we can use. We had like very big tags and now we're developing to very small tags that we can implant on fish and we can track them and we can know exactly what they're doing. Uh, we also have these very sophisticated uh, devices that allow us to see what fish is doing uh, when he's swimming and that's what I present at the beginning of the, the presentation. So let's talk a little bit of the project that I was involved in that uh, focus on trying to understand swimming behavior and uh, the impact of hydraulics on the behavior of salmon smolt. And uh, this uh, project was developed in Norway uh, under the umbrella of a um, project called SafePast that standard for the safe and efficient two ways migration of salmonids and the European eel past the hydropower structures and involved different people, uh, a great team from people from the institute where I work, from NTNU University in Trondheim, Sintef, uh, Karls University here in Sweden as well, and DTU Aqua for DK, and um, also different uh, other companies. So we start by a position some uh, tax and fish and position some hydrophones in a river and this river is in south of Norway and here you can see you have the river going towards this direction here you have the intake for the hydropower plant here you have like a small weird and fish can pass here through a bypass and here you have a fish right in the middle of the, the weir. So we install uh, 18 hydroacoustic hydrophones and we tagged about 100 fish. After that, we managed to have the position of all the fish every five seconds. So again, we're not talking about a, a large scale, but a very small scale. And we also went around with a very funny boat and we could uh, get information about 
all the hydrodynamics of the flow in that area of the river. And we also model that in a, what's called a CFD, a computer fluid dynamics uh, system, so in the lab. So we had all the biological data and all the hydraulic data, and then we combined that. And by combining that, we could start having some answers of like where do fish go uh, and what is affecting fish and what is the cause of the fish going left or right, or one of the causes, because there are several ones. So we start by trying to understand why fish end up going to the tunnels and the, to the turbines or why did fish end up passing. So we had about uh, 42 fish uh, going to the tunnel and about 46 fish going through the bypass. And the idea is that they all go through the bypass so they can keep going to the sea and not end up in the turbines. So we divide the river in four different areas, uh, from the west to the east bank. And what we found was that the fish that approach on the west bank, they end up going through the bypass. Around 87.5 of the fish that approach on the west bank, they went through the bypass. While 62.5 of the fish that approach on the east bank, they end up in the intake. So we thought, OK, maybe there's something behind this. So we tried to go a little bit further and try to analyze and see what fish were doing from point A to point B. We had the position of the fish for every five seconds, and we knew we had like a very detailed information in terms of hydraulics as well. So we tried to understand like fish swimming speed, so it was the velocity the fish was from one point to another one, and what we called the angular difference, that was the difference between the direction of the fish and the direction of the flow. And this is what we found, that both velocity and the turbulent kinetic energy, meaning the energy associated to these fluctuations of velocity, will decrease um, the angular uh, difference of the fish, meaning that the highest the velocity and the highest the turbulent fish will end up going on the same way that, that the flow, meaning that the fish decrease their response, their behavioral response of being willing to change in different directions. They just end up kind of follow the flow a little bit. So we did some more research, and one of the things that we did was try, we tried to predict the fish uh, movement. We tried to understand now if you can go left or right. So we did that in an individual-based model, so based, basically based on each uh, movement of the fish, each fish. And uh, the idea is like this information helped to improve future management and engineering solutions for safe fish migration. And so nowadays what we're trying to do is trying to find a, a solution for a fish so the fish don't go uh, towards the intake and they end up going to that direction. And we're doing some hydraulic modeling that helps us to study like different configurations of different structures, so to be implemented. Hopefully, we'll be impl implemented in the field this spring. Uh, I don't know if I have time just to show a quick case. This is the second case that we did something similar. We set some hydrophones as well. This is another river. And we had the position of the fish. Some of them, they went to the tunnel here and others of them, they went to the spillway and keep moving to, towards the sea. It's also uh, some smalls again. And here we try to apply different measures uh, from changing the bank of the river here in this area, uh, put some spurs here and deflectors, and by analyzing all the hydraulics again and overlapping the position of the fish, then we can, could get um, like a prediction of what could be a good mitigation measure and what could we use in the field. We also tested in terms of econo economical costs, in terms of implementation, the effect of migration, etc. And we found that, for instance, like the implementation of a rack in front could be a good solution for making fish to move forward and avoid going to the intake. So take-home message, basically, very quickly. <laughs> 
So we want, I want you to keep in mind that uh, the fish movement emerged from the interaction with fluid hydrodynamics. It's not an orange. We don't put the fish in water and just not just go with the flow. It's a little bit more complex. Fish can feel, and then they react to these variations. The fish use their appendix to navigate and to maneuver, and they also use the hydrodynamics of the flow uh, to reduce the energy to swim. And uh, this navigation is mediated by different hydraulic uh, clues. And it's very important that we use all this theory and knowledge that we have and apply it, because this will allow us to improve uh, fish conservation. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>